Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Wander to the Edge. My name is Adam Asher from The Edge of Adventure. Hey, Adam. <laughs> I'm Zan. I'm from Where Gals Wander. And it's good to see you. Man, this is... You all right? <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. This is a busy Saturday, and uh, I thought maybe you thought you guys had an earthquake or something. That maybe. The Who knows? Or... Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, great to see Saturday. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's, I think it's time for some coffee. What do you think? Coffee is definitely in order for sure. Okay, let me it's, get some. It's... Isn't that fancy? You are such just a wizard There's of no, technology. Hey, there is no stopping us now. The, you know, oh, if this you is a great somehow show. Actually, yeah, if you could get that coffee actually here in my hands, that would impress me. Okay. All right, I'm going to work on that. Uh, okay. First thing I'm going to have to do is search that on the internet and see if there's such a thing, <laughs> such a way. Uh, probably uh, have it delivered, something like that. I'm sure it can be done. Yeah. So, uh, But it is good to see you. we got another great show, and looking forward to talking to Susan today. She joins us from thisbigwildworld.com. She's a great blogger. She has a great story to tell. You're going to love getting to know her today. And so i uh, just excited to get to share another one of our great friends with the uh, Travel Tribe. Yep. I'm looking forward to getting to meet her. She seems so full of energy and fun. And that's exactly what I need on this sleepy Saturday morning. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Zan, the name of this show is what? Wander to the edge. Susan, Hi. welcome to the program. Hi, friends. How are you? It's good to see you. Listen, good to see you. I think winter came a little bit early. How how's life in Minnesota? Because you're joining us today from Minnesota in what city? Minneapolis, okay, and so Minneapolis. it is rough. <laughs> a little about twenty five degrees out there today, so I'm happy to be in here talking to you guys. Yeah. A little yeah. bit chilly, but you love the state. I know that I do. it is a beautiful, beautiful place for so much of the year. Tell us why you love it. So, yeah, the most common thing that people tell me when they I, they hear I'm from Minnesota is that isn't it cold all the time? And it does get very cold, but I like to think that we experience all four amazing seasons. So it's almost like you live in four places um, without having to change your address. So, you know, we don't have the massive peaks that you see in other places um, around the country and around the world, but uh, we have pretty much something for everybody from biking to kayaking to um, hiking. We've got the Boundary Waters, um, Superior Hiking Trail and Voyagers National Park, um, which are all overlooked and hidden gems that a lot of people don't get to experience. I forget that the national park is located there as well. Yeah. It's one of the only parks that you primarily explore by water. So you literally rent a houseboat or paddle yourself around the park and explore. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Still trying to make my way through that, that big list. So yep. but I'm a huge national park lover myself. You are the third blogger, I guess you would say that we've had on here from Minneapolis. It's kind of surprising. So we've had, adventuring gal and we've had julie mm -hmm. halverson yeah yep. so who would have thought we got a little blogging crew here yeah 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 must be must be something about minneapolis and uh, the mm -hmm. beautiful state of minnesota so uh also you know i met you i feel like it's been two three years uh, mm -hmm. probably susan several several years back you have a very impressive social media presence. You've got a great website, beautiful website. And I think you actually, you were telling me you've uh, enhanced it a little bit in the last uh, couple of months, but it's a beautiful website, beautiful blog. And 
I kind of would like you just to put into perspective why travel blogging was a thing for you. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I never thought my stories were that interesting, <laughs> but after years of my friends telling me that they thought that people would enjoy reading my stories and seeing my photos, um, when I went through a big career change a couple of years ago, I quit a great job and went back to school full time. And I said, okay, if I'm ever going to do it, now's the time. I'm going to sit down one weekend. I knew nothing about web design and I created this big wild world. And now we are several years later and um, I'm just in love with it now as I was when I started. And I'm still shocked and amazed that people follow and engage and read what I have to share. Well, I think you do so in a very personal way. And we're going to talk about that. In particular, there's there's one particular blog post or travel expedition that you went on that we want to get to in just a few minutes. We're going to save that because it truly is fascinating. But let's get to know you a little bit, little bit more. And just as I was looking over your material and your blog, there are some interesting stories that I think uh, people will find fascinating. Tell us about Sydney and taxi drivers. Oh, man. I might need some. You know, Adam, I heard that there's a problem that you always forget or eat all the chips. So <laughs> I'm sure to bring okay. some. You might want to have some. <laughs> a bit of a twisty turn of a story. <laughs> Here, grab some chips. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so I studied abroad in Australia, um, in Sydney, actually. And this would have been in a phase of my life where I enjoyed a heavy amount of drinking. Um, and I decided uh, to leave the bar a little bit early and um, thought it'd be a great idea to make friends with someone else outside and share a taxi ride. And it was very clear to me that my place was before the other person's drop off point was. And so I expected to be dropped off first. The taxi driver took them first. And, you know, I had been drinking a lot, so I thought, oh, maybe they're just making a circle. Well, it ended up that the taxi driver started driving me out of Sydney, like out of town. Um, fortunately, I wasn't too drunk to realize what was going on, but this was in the time when you had prepaid cell phones. Like I didn't have a phone and I was almost out of minutes. And so I tried to call a friend, couldn't get a hold of them. And long story short, I ended up jumping out at a stop sign and running until I could hear the water because I knew I lived close to the ocean. And I walked all night until I found my place in the morning along the ocean. And so thankfully, I was with it enough to understand what was happening. But that was my lesson to watch what I drink and not leave my friends when I travel. Yes. I mean, that's, that story ends very well, but right. you're right. That's some, something to be taken very, uh, very seriously. You gotta be, gotta be careful. Um, so Zan, it's your turn to ask a question. I've got another question, but I don't want to, I don't want to like ask all the questions. Well, I guess tell us I'm, a little bit more about going abroad and going to school in Sydney. What drew you to that particular location? I remember as a little kid doing like a book report or something on and seeing pictures of the Sydney Opera House. And I don't know about you guys, but there's just some images that like stick with you your whole life. And um, when I realized that my engineering program, there were very few schools that I could do exchanges with or study abroad programs with. And Sydney was on the list. It was like a no brainer for me. So it was kind of like, I feel like kind of a life dream coming true that I had thought of since I was a little kid. And is that what started your travel, I guess, passion or began your travel career? <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, um, oh man. So my hometown has a sister city in Japan. It's really weird. I grew up in a small town in Indiana and um, I had the opportunity to do a family exchange when I was nine and go stay with a family in Japan. And then they came in our sister city and then they, um, a child from their town came and stayed with our family. Um, and because I'm adopted and one of the few things that we always knew is that um, I was likely part Japanese. 
my parents supported me in going on that very expensive adventure at a very young age. But I just, I remember being young and experiencing, seeing life through other people's eyes and just being like, wow, there is this big world out there. And I just want to know more about how all these other people live. I can't imagine at age nine, going to live with another family on the other side of the world. It was, it wasn't like, a, it was like 10 days. So it wasn't for like okay. a long time, but yeah, it was, we went to school. We, my friend and I stayed, it was a family that spoke mostly Japanese and um, we had learned some of the language. So I could say some basic things, but <laughs> there was an instant where I couldn't read all the symbols on the toilet. And it was one with all the like features <laughs> I ended up spraying all over the bathroom, but we figured it out together with the family. All right, well, let's get back to Australia. Mm -hmm. And I read somewhere that you've been attacked by a kangaroo. <laughs> yes. Um, have you ever seen those like um, pictures of kangaroos on their back feet, like kind of punching? Well, they actually do that. Um, and I know this because I'm notorious for I always have food with me, always. So um, I was visiting this beach with my roommate um, who was Australian. And of course, she said, take all the food out of your bag, just leave it in the car. Well, I had grabbed everything, but being me, I had another granola bar at the bottom of my bag I had forgotten about. Well, that kangaroo kind of hopped up to me and I was like, oh, this is so cool. Look, he's curious about me and thought I was having a moment. And then it sat back on its feet and just started honking and like hopping towards me. <laughs> I ended up having to throw my bag and run away from it. Um, no. But yes, don't carry food in your pack if you're going to see kangaroos in the wild. <laughs> I had no idea. I've heard stories about the boxing kangaroo. Um, did it go after your pack then? Did it like it try did. to? <laughs> wow. Luckily, okay. it just got the, it like kind of tore it open. It didn't damage anything else, but it yeah. found that granola bar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, so uh, another one I want you to tell the audience, uh, maybe give us some tips on what to do with a scooter when you're riding a scooter, perhaps in Vietnam. That's a random question, Adam. Like of all the questions you're going to ask for this, best. just one you, you thought of off the top of your head. <laughs> I dig for the best. I want nothing with <laughs> inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. Well, I would say just take it easy and practice and know what all the buttons do before you tear out into a gravelly road. Because if you're like me, you will probably fall and almost get hit by some sort of truck or vehicle. Um, so, I mean, most people have stories about riding scooters through Hanoi, where if you've seen the photos, they're just from side to side of of the road, like nonstop scooters everywhere. But I actually had my accident out in the countryside where I rounded a corner too soon and I hit the gas instead of the brake and I kind of just freaked out. And fortunately I didn't get hit by anything, but um, had some scrapes and some bruises to my ego for sure. Just listening to all of your travel stories, I'm feeling like this big wild world, like emphasis on the wild in terms of some of the adventures that you've had. I mean, it's like scary encounters with Susan. <laughs> you know, but I you promise know. they're not yeah. all scary. And I've learned <laughs> and I try to share what I've learned so that others don't make the same mistake. But there certainly has been some mishaps. <laughs> and of course, I'm I'm teasing, but <laughs> Um, you know, maybe as Adam's pulling up the map, kind of share with our, our folks watching here, like how many countries have you been to? Let's get a sense in terms of how extensively you've traveled. Yeah. So I'm one of those weird people. I don't keep track of like a number. Um, but if I had to guess, it's probably in the forties, maybe fifties. Um, yeah, I I have trouble keeping track because that's like, at what point do you actually count it? Is it if you stay overnight? Is it, you know, if you have a layover? But it's probably in the 40s or 50s. Wow. How, how about you guys? <laughs> Quite a few, but I don't count them either. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, especially... Well, if I were counting, I would count the ones where I, it's just even a connection, right? You get to add mm -hmm. that to your list. Mm -hmm. um, 
We are talking today to a great friend and traveler, Susan, and you'll find her blog very well done, super interesting, lots of adventures at thisbigwildworld.com. And you'll, you know, that's what you should look for on social media as well. And you're getting to know her in this sense of adventure that she has and the, you know, the kind of adventure, which I I don't know, maybe you're um, living on the edge somewhere out there, a little bit on the the dangerous side. But you you believe that life is better with adventure and you need to tell us why. Yeah. So, you know, I, when I first started my blog, I tried to think about like, what's a great tagline? And it took me a while to realize that the heart of what I write about is that life's better with adventure and that we as humans and people who share this experience are better when we have adventure in our lives. And what I love about adventure is that I really think that it's not a place, it's not how far or how big or anything like that, what activity you're doing, it's a mindset. And what's cool about that is that that means that anybody can be adventurous, anybody can be an adventure because if it's just a mindset, it's about pushing your boundaries, trying new things, and that could be trying a new restaurant or new type of food in your town, or it could be climbing a mountain on the other side of the world. And so I try to write about all kinds of things so that someone who's trying to find their inner adventure, whatever that means to them, can find it on this big wild world. That's awesome. I noticed that Adam didn't let me answer the question about how many countries that I've been to, Adam. So I- Okay, let's go ahead and change the subject. (laughs) I want to hear. Yes. So my answer is not very exciting, but I do have a story that ties to it. So I've only been to two countries outside of the U.S. One was on my honeymoon, mm-hmm. which is really the first time that I was ever on a plane. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. And I was 27. And so and then um, we took my girls to Mexico one time, but that doesn't really count. But here's a story that I think would fit in with your blog. I used to travel a lot for work. I would make 60, 70 round trip flights a year. Oh my God. And one time we were flying into San Diego and we were suddenly rerouted. And the reason we were rerouted was there was a sniper on the top of one of the buildings <laughs> shooting at the airplanes coming in. So oh we had to keep circling and circling until finally they flew us to Ontario, California, which is about <laughs> three hours away land. And then we had to wait another three hours to get a bus to come (laughs) and pick us up and then drive us all the way back to San Diego. So it took me about 16 hours to travel to San Diego. But as you're telling me all these things that happened to you on these trips, that's one thing that came to mind, like this, like you and I need to have drinks (laughs) and just share stories. (laughs) I'm I'm glad the sniper didn't get you. (laughs) Okay, you can talk now, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> tell us about Prepared Girls Guides, that series of posts, and you know why it's important to be a prepared girl. Yeah, so the Prepared Girls Guides are meant for... Prepared Girl is a girl who's prepared for whatever the adventure throws her way. And so... Um, You know, they have the gear and the knowledge and the resources to stay cool, calm, and collected, whatever surprises happen on their adventure. And so, but that's balanced with a minimalist packing mindset. And so it's not about just throw everything in the kitchen sink in your pack or in your suitcase. It's about really being thoughtful about what do you need to know and have handy to stay safe and be prepared for whatever might happen on the adventure. So it's really about balancing those two things, staying lightweight and minimalist and being prepared and feeling confident that you can enjoy yourself and not get kidnapped or attacked by a a kangaroo. (laughs) What would be the top three items that you would recommend as part of that pack, the essentials to always have with you when you travel? So number one, absolutely always duct tape. I'm not kidding. I carry a small roll with me or I wrap some around a pen. 
because I have um, tended to wounds <laughs> myself and my friends by using it as a bandage. I've repaired gear. I've repaired suitcases with it, shoes, everything, duct tape, I'm telling you. Um, I also always carry a life straw. So that's um, in case the water is not clean where I'm going or I run out of water and then a headlamp. Those are three things that no, even if I'm just going to like Paris or like a city, I, I carry those things with me just in case. Susan, you're a very fascinating person <laughs> and traveler. Okay. And the duct tape's a great idea. I love it. So I'm going to start carrying that everywhere I go just in case. Uh, but I do want to be sure that we transition the conversation over to this uh, side of you that is very important to you and you've you've done some wonderful posts about it you've shared this particular travel experience and you call it dna travel mm -hmm. um, tell us about that the concept of dna travel what is it mm -hmm. and then also you as a person who grew up as adopted mm -hmm. and then perhaps not knowing your own heritage and then th through the DNA technology, being able to kind of discover that. Give us some background because I think, I think it's fascinating. I think it's a very inspiring story and I think a lot of people uh, can identify. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, DNA travel is just a growing um, trend in travel in general. And so um, whether you're adopted, not adopted, whatever, um, people are turning to discover the places that are in their DNA results. As an adoptee, there's all kinds of different experiences, right? So in my particular case, I'm adopted and I don't know really anything about my birth parents. Um, there's a lot of adoptees who have relationships with their birth parents and um, some who don't like me. And so for me, when I travel, it's always been like I can see myself and everyone I meet because I didn't know where I came from. I didn't know what culture or country or anything I really identified with other than we talked about, we always thought I was part Japanese, um, but never confirmed that really. And so, um, you know, this year was my 40th birthday, which was supposed to be this really exciting year of self-discovery and traveling to all the places in my DNA results, which I got last year for my birthday. Obviously, coronavirus in 2020 happened, but um, I did manage to, um, my intention was not to meet my parents or get matched with family members or anything like that. That's a, that's a complicated conversation, but um, many adoptees aren't doing DNA testing to necessarily meet family members. But for me, it was about you know, what countries do I d identify with? What cultures do I come from? and really just trying to learn about the story of me through travel after having visited so many places around the world. So I like finally go somewhere and be like, wow, like part of me comes from here. And so um, right before the pandemic, I actually landed just a couple of days before everything locked down here. Um, I went to Finland, which I didn't have a large percentage in my results, but I was absolutely shocked. I never in a million years thought that I was part Finnish. Um, so I had to go because I, I love winter and I love um, the Arctic. Um, so I went in the winter and I spent about 10 days there in February um, exploring um, the, the Arctic and um, up in the north and then also in Helsinki. Um, and just it felt really... Um, calming to just be at a place and know like there's a piece of me somewhere somewhere in the past that came from this place um and i interestingly discovered that i am apparently a natural at cross-country skiing which i never expected and i wouldn't have discovered if i hadn't gone on this trip probably so yeah it's been a journey for sure and i will i will go the other places that i had planned this year when it's safe to travel again but. I have done a similar DNA test and I know it shows you the, the actual regions that it suspects that you're from. And is that sort of the path that you took trying mm -hmm. to specifically go into those areas? I did to some extent. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, with, so I withheld some of the identifying 
So fun fact about DNA tests, they don't tell you this because they want to add you to their database, but if you want, you can withhold your matches, which restricts some information in your reporting. Um, but so they have, if I have matches in the database, they have them and I can call them tonight if I want to and have them released, but um, I haven't done that yet. Got but it. as much as the information would allow me to figure out the regions, I did, yeah. So what are some of the other regions that then are now on your list once we get past the restrictions on travel sure. to complete this project and this experience? Um, yeah, so on on the plan for this year had been to make a return trip to Japan, um, but this time as an adult that and really focused on outdoors kind of adventures. So um, I wanted to do some hiking and more kind of exploring outside of the Tokyo area. Um, and then Eastern Europe. So there's kind of a band on the map um, that goes across several countries. And so I hadn't decided yet which specific country or area I was going to go to within that band, but I was planning to visit Eastern Europe. Um, so both of those will, will be rescheduled. They say that one way to really experience the culture, aside from going and immersing yourself in it, is through the food or the music or the language. You mentioned that you learned a little bit of Japanese when you were nine, but have you taken mm -hmm. any other steps to kind of experience culture during this COVID time to still get some of that experience? Yeah, that's a good question. Not, not particularly during COVID. Um, I did end up studying Japanese language and culture for several years um, after that trip. Um, but yeah, I feel like I haven't had that much free time during COVID like I was hoping <laughs> I would. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I've been more busy than ever. <laughs> yeah, I think depending on the type of work that a person does, some of it, we've become so efficient in working from home and working remotely that um, the the idea of staying home might sound like you're going to get to take it easy. But I think people around the world can, can attest to the fact that in, in so many ways it has uh, probably increased the workload. I mean, I think in some, for a lot of people, it just uh, has made, has made so many of us more busy because you, you have, less time lost in the commute. So you try to do more and you're not as limited in terms of the end of the day. So yeah, I get that. Yeah. Um, Except so, Adam, he's a slacker. It, I am. I, I am. know that. <laughs> he eats all the chips and he's slacking. I know. <laughs> I mean, and it's a Saturday. So. I have a question for you. Yes. Should I be offended or honored that you're not wearing the hat today? That's a good question. That's a good question. So let me let me let you into my world, okay? <laughs> so because I do the two different podcasts, mm -hmm. right? I, in order to make sure that they're distinguishable and you kind of, oh. you know, don't lose track. So what I began doing back, you know, I don't know, a couple months ago, two, three months ago, was there's a, there's two for, for Wander to the Edge, there's a few things that you you know you're watching Wander to the Edge because the, there's a lot of the blue coloring, right, mm -hmm. including the blue background. Another way you can tell that you're watching uh, Wander to the Edge is Zan is. I was going to say I'm I'm kind of <laughs> obvious kind of over here. You know, the blue background two, is like differentiating <laughs> between the two. I'm doing something and wrong Zan's there. <laughs> yeah, so it, because of the blue background, mm -hmm. that's reason number one. Reason number two is because Zan is on the show. That's how you know you're watching Wander to the Edge. And I also like I've gone to like not wearing the hat as much uh, for right, wander so to the edge and using that yeah. on on so you shouldn't be offended. That's it's a long way of saying you shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, but because when we did the party uh, a few weeks back, mm -hmm. we did yeah. a party. It became it became a hat party, or somebody led me to believe it was going to be a hat party, and then a bunch of people just showed up wearing tiaras, <laughs> and I got confused, but. Uh, but no, it's. Uh, I feel like tiaras well, should be allowed every week, and you can right? just not wear the hat if you don't That's want. What them. I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thank really you. need to fight for this one, Zan. Yeah, I know. But here's the thing that Adam didn't tell you. So Adam and I have this thing that started off when we first grew our friendship. One was um, 
snapping each other photos of the boots that we were wearing that particular day. You know, <laughs> because love boots, so happy it's fall. And then the second thing was to check in and see how Adam's hair was that day. <laughs> so if he's having, am I right? That's, that's true. <laughs> Uh, and most of the time, it was a good hair day. Most of most the time. time. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to cover that up, you know, with right. the hair. Wow. Kind of let yeah. it out and breathe. Yeah. yeah. We don't have like, it's not like a Garth Brooks thing, right? Okay. Where I only wear the hat. It's like, I do wear the hat, but not only. Um, <laughs> gosh, great, great to have everybody with us today. Great conversation. And Susan, this, this particular uh, the DNA travel, you know, this mm -hmm. particular blog post and this journey. And I, you know, I hate that it, it got interrupted with COVID. I mean, COVID took so many yeah. things from us, a very serious scenario and, and all that. But um, I know you, you look forward to completing that journey. What was really the most meaningful part of that entire experience of doing the DNA test, finding out what you found out, knowing now what you know about your heritage, most important, most meaningful aspect of that? Yeah, I think for an adoptee who knows very little about their birth parents, which I know there's a lot of them out there. Um, so hi, everybody who can relate to that. Um, I think it's just the comfort of finally feeling like there was a place for me. And so um, you know, I always joked that I was every culture and no culture and because I really didn't know anything about what my background was. And so I just, I journaled when I was in Finland and like going up to that trip. And I just remember writing that it, there was like a really unique feeling when I felt the wheels land there. Like it was, I was like, this is going to be different. Um, and I actually intentionally chose to go on that trip alone just so that I could kind of take it all in and experience it myself for the first time. So I think it's just feeling like you kind of found a part of yourself, which I know is a little bit vague and not like a specific part of Finland. It's just like, it was like a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's other places that maybe we don't have a DNA, DNA connection with, but we feel this personal connection with. Mm -hmm. And Adam, I know for you, there's several places that you just felt at home outside of the U.S. Well, that's that's true. Now, that the, on the DNA side, I have not personally done the DNA test. I want to. I think probably I will at some point. There's the side of me that has been reluctant to do so out of some, you know, you think, I mean, who who has access to that information? Does it, it you know, is it just theirs? Do they sell it? So on and so forth. Um, and of course, we live in a day and age with uh, uh, there's such a, you know, I mean, they can find, in my opinion, is they can find out anything they want to find out about you if they want to. Yeah. So at some point, I anticipate I'll probably do it. And knowing what I know about my background, I know there's a good bit of um, obviously a good bit of European, British Isles, little I joke about being um uh, part Viking because they're, I think it's because of relatives who have had the test done. I can run the math and know that uh, consequently I have a little bit of, of that in me as well. But to, to Zan's point, yes, I do feel at home in Latin American countries and places where they speak Spanish. And then it, I have no heritage in that regard, but I think it's also a beautiful thing that I, that a person can, and in my case, I can feel so at home in those places. And I know that that's really a gift, if you will, that was given to me. It's a part of me as the, the person that I am. It's not even a part of my heritage. I've got a lot of things in my heritage, proud of it. You know, I'm not trying to disown my heritage, but I do have attachments to, to places and to, to cultures that, you know, I, I guess just, I don't come by naturally. It, it's a result of, of who I am, not where I came from, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am also part Viking, proven, DNA test, just mentioning. <laughs> so, yeah. It's funny because when I did take the DNA test, to your point about being adopted, Susan, I found out that I actually have a um, first degree cousin that I did not know existed wow. as a result of taking the test. And we found each other. And we're friends on Facebook now and such, but it was it was kind of amazing what you can find out 
just through those journeys. So, yeah, you really, I think, have to be prepared for, like, I always say, be prepared for the worst possible outcome. And if you're good with that, then you're ready to know. Like, right. right. Uh, in this case, it was a good surprise, but. <laughs> yep. Well, it is interesting. You know, we live in a we live in a country where there's so there's so much heritage from so many different parts of the world, and we're the melting pot. And and so here we are with our own unique American culture, and it's made up of so many cultures from around the world. And I think that's one of the things I I like about our country. And um, to know, like you've had the opportunity to find out about your heritage, to know that it was meaningful. It's meaningful for anybody. Not you don't have to be an adoptee for, to Absolutely. to enjoy that because so many of us don't know. We don't know that much about our heritage, and it's a fascinating experience to find out. But I know for you and for having heard about that as you were going through that and watching your blog posts and and the social media posts, I know it was a very meaningful experience for you. And and I just I think it's I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think you shared it very well and allowed allowed us as as the audience to participate in it. So Susan joining us today from This Big Wild World. You can look her up online at thisbigwildworld.com. And um, we just appreciate your friendship. We appreciate um, being a part of, of the community and just the way that you um, you love us in return. You know, the thing that that we're learning through this program is just how many friends we have from around the world. And it's, it's a pretty awesome thing. So just yeah. we're fortunate to count you among them. Thank you. Yeah, I love what you two have created together. Um, when I first started blogging, I thought, you know, how genuine of a connection can you actually make over the internet? And I just continue to be amazed by the quality of people and connections that I've built. And so it's so funny to think that how, years ago we met through um, the blogging world and um, I've liked and commented on so many of Zan's social media posts over the years. And so, um, yeah, I just really appreciate the community that you're creating of all these great connections that have been built through the blogosphere. Oh, thank you. Well, I have to do it through video because I'm too lazy to blog. I know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to plug where gals wander at this point. So yeah, definitely building a community there. And then Adam, to his point, builds it through video and just really reaching all around the world through the edge of adventure to connect us with a real purpose, I think, moving forward, too. Well, ladies, have a great Saturday. Let's let everybody get back to their weekend. Um, but uh, please, uh, if you don't already, you need to follow Susan. Check out the blog, thisbigwildworld.com. Check out the blog. Check her out online uh, through social media if you haven't already. And just get to know her because she's a remarkable person. And we're thankful to count her among our friends here at Wander to the Edge. Thank you so much. Have a great Saturday. You too. Bye. All right. So... Zen, I guess that means it's it's time to close the program with the outro, right? Well, I yeah, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I win. Wander to the edge.